start with the application from last week. And then we're going to do our first lecture on um, not the what you're writing, but the how you're writing it part, OK? Because you know stories are made up of two things. One of them is not the cord to my microphone. Um, they're made up of what you're writing and how you're doing it, right? So, um, but let's, let's do some of this application from last week so that we can talk about this and kind of show you guys how this goes about. And I'm, let's talk about three basic stories. And what we'll do together is we'll start brainstorming how to make it them a little more unique. We'll look at some examples of these um, in current films and books and things like that. And so um, the first one is the hero's journeys. Hero's journey. Um, and we're just going to do a very simplified um, example of the hero's journey, right? We've got, um, we've got, um, you've got a youngster and a boring life. I say youngster, usually it's, um, you know, whatever, but a teenager, right? Some youth in a boring life. Um, and then a mentor figure <coughs> draws them on a quest. And then um, huge adversity. And then back home. That's like four simple beats of the hero's journey. Okay. Uh, the other story we'll look at is the uh, Cinderella, the rags to riches. Right. So. Um, in this one, we have a person out of place being, um, uh, what do you call it, being persecuted, right? Right? And then um, they get uh, unexpected, even magical help. They um, prove themselves and then rule over those who persecuted them. Now, these are not the only ways that you could tell these stories. I'm just doing this for simplicity's sake um, and kind of hanging these beats. And then the third one we will do is the. Um, Underdog sports, right? Underdog sports. You start with a, um, a, a, a loner outcast. Or a dog. What's that? Or a dog, an or actual dog. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, a loner outcast who then um, this has a special talent. Um, and joins a, joins a group to show it off. Boy, I'm getting worse and worse at the right. That says joins a group. All right. Um, the group is divided and fails. And then through the loner becomes part of a team, learns to be in the team, and the team learns to work together. And then they win the championship. Could you argue that's like a heist story? Well, the, you, a heist can be part, you know, can be the way that you do this. But um, I want to look at kind of some archetypal examples of these in cinema um, or in books. And then we'll start brainstorming how we can make one of these our own. The whole idea is to take setting, because last, um, last week was setting, to add new settings to these to make them distinctive and different through um, that you can take this sort of same framework. Now, the thing I'm not going to do right now that I want you to do is take these and maybe a story of your, uh, one of your own, you've noticed, and ask yourself the why. Why do these stories work? 
Why does the person um, being persecuted, ruling over those who persecuted, and what kind of emotion is that creating in readers? And why do they like that story? Why does the loner outcast um, becoming part of a team and winning the championship, what emotions does that give? And how can you fulfill that in different ways? Uh, the hero's journey um, is, is, you know, this one is about gaining experience in the world. This one is about setting right what was wrong, right? The Cinderella story is always, you know, she was supposed to be loved um, in this family, and she isn't. And so fat magical forces are coming and setting it right what was wrong. So this is a restoring of, uh, of balance. Um, and this one's kind of like the team dynamic. It's I'm a loner. I, I don't have anything in my life, but now I have this team. Um, so hero's journey. You, what, what, what examples can you guys think of this in film or books that kind of follows this general format? The Hobbit. The Hobbit. Yes, Hobbit. Um, Hobbit is like the, one of the perfect examples, right? Particularly the movie adaptations for, uh, for Bilbo. Boring life. Mentor figure draws him on a quest. It's really hard, and then I come back home, right? That is, that, I mean, the book is called There and Back Again, right? Um, so, yeah, uh, Star Wars. So um, the boring life is an interesting one to look at with this uh, because normally in the hero's journey, the hero is like some sort of farmer, right? What is Luke? He's a moisture farmer, right? He's still a farmer. It's just spacey. You know, it's, it's fantastical. He farms moisture. What does that mean? We don't know. Who cares? It's different. Um, that, that is a way that, you, that you, he's using setting. Uh, when George Lucas said, hey, I'm going to take this thing that is mostly be done as a qu classical quest um, and sort of a, you know, a heroic quest, and I'm going to make it a space western, right? Um, and that is merely transposing this, this to a new genre, a new setting, but keeping the same core story. Any, any others you want to throw up on here that, um, that seems to fit for you? Harry Potter. Harry Potter, yeah, yeah. Harry Potter's more this, I would say. Um, he's out of place and being persecuted. He receives unexpected magical help, and he eventually becomes a ruler um, over those who, who persecuted him. Um, you can definitely say that any one of these, you can be like, no, that's a hero's journey, and it kind of is. Um, I, I would put Harry over here. Um, um, the Matrix is a hero's journey. Um, definitely Harry Potter has some, some elements. Any others you think you're thinking of? Aragon. Aragon, yeah. Lion King. Lion King. Lion King is definitely um, straight up this thing. And because Lion King is, you can probably guess that Hamlet is, since Lion King is based on Hamlet. Um, so, yeah. Um, rags to riches, other than Harry Potter and Cinderella. Uh, any other examples of this you guys can think of? Oliver Twist, it's a good one, yep. Yep, a lot of Dickens, a lot of um, the early like Horatio Alger stories and that sort of thing. The, uh, the American Dream is this, yeah. Slumdog Millionaire. Slumdog Millionaire, yeah. The, what is that quote that people say? It's like, the American Dream is, partial, is, is this because there are no poor people in America just embarrassed yet to be millionaires, right? Um, I can't remember what the exact quote is, but it's the, the American dream is this idea that everybody is out of place in being persecuted until they have achieved their American dream. I'm not saying that's true. I'm just saying that's kind of what the gestalt is here, yeah. What about Count of Monte Cristo? Um, Count of Monte Cristo, yeah. You could, you could take this and say, and go to revenge story. Um, and once you take, the, say, Rag, Cinderella and the revenge story are the same thing, then suddenly Count of Monte Cristo and, you know, various Tarantino films and things like that are all... <laughs> Uh, the same story as Cinderella, uh, depending on how you look at it. But once you can start transposing these, one of the ones I thought of is Dragonflight uh, by uh, Anne McCaffrey, one of my favorite uh, fantasy science fiction books, um, is this sort of thing. Um, underdog sports. So uh, what, what do we got for underdog sports stories? Elantris. Uh, yeah, you could, you could say that Elantris. Um, I, I would say that really Way of Kings is more. Um, if you look at this format, um, um, yeah, the, it's this. Uh, Ender's Game is one. Um, what's that? Uh, pitch Perfect. Do you guys see Pitch Perfect? Did it hit all these points? Outcast, 
Special talent joins the group. They're divided and failed. The loner becomes the leader, and then they win the championship. Hey! Um, Hoosiers is the classic example. Um, Miracle, uh, Avengers, uh, you could say it's is, is this. Um, Wreck-It Ralph. Wreck-It Ralph, yeah, yeah. Uh, Wreck-It Ralph is rags to riches. Yeah, Wreck-It Ralph is really rags to riches more, I think. Um, Ralph, uh, yeah. Um, but the thing about these, these kind of classic archetypes, and again, you can define them however you want. You can come up with your own and say, um, or whatever. What you should start to be able to do as a writer is look at a story and say, why is this story that I love working? Can I boil it down to four or five bullet points that is the story and lift out the setting? The setting doesn't matter, right? Up here we have an epic fantasy, we have several sports movies, and we have a science fiction. And they all hit the same points, right? The same beats. Um, now something like Way of Kings, we actually have like five different storylines. Um, so specifically Kaladin's, um, Kaladin's story um, is an underdog sports story, but you've, you, can, you, can, you can take up and put up the heist if you wanted to as its own. Um, <coughs> again, the difference between being a cook and a chef is the chef is able to say, hey, this wonderful thing that I ate, what's in that? Can I boil it down to why it's tasty? And then can I take that and make it my own? Um, the application on this, so let's ask, hero's journey. Uh, let's brainstorm a few. Um, what boring thing could a protagonist be doing that makes their life dull and boring that they want to escape that isn't farming, whether it's moisture or something like that? Math homework. Math homework, okay. Let's give you math homework. Dentistry. Okay, a dentist, yes. Flipping burgers. <laughs> yeah, flipping burgers. Tax preparation. <laughs> Taxes. Okay. You get this kind of idea where, um, let's do something that's in a different, different genre, okay? Not in our world. Pick a different genre. Um, and, and give me something boring and monotonous that someone could be doing, yeah. Uh, the person in charge is cleaning up after superheroes. Cleaning up after superheroes. <laughs> uh, oh, I love that one, yeah. The ditch digger in a magical world. Yeah, yeah, the ditch digger in the magical world. The ditch digger. Um, all right? They don't have to be a farmer. Stable manager. Stable manager, okay. Okay, go science fiction on, him, on me. Custodian uh, in a space station. What's that? Custodian of the space station. All right. Triple exterminator. <laughs> <laughs> Magical beasties, a pest control. It's like science fiction pest control. Oh, wow. I like that one. Isn't that an inch science fiction pest control? Think of all the cool pests you could come up with that this person's bored of, but is really exciting. This is a way that you could make the opening of a story really engaging, despite the fact that the, you know, what you want to get across is this character is bored with their life. It could still be exciting to us, right? They're like, not another infestation of you know, space worms that feed off of uh, plasma beams, right? Um, <laughs> And you, you kill them by overloading them by, you know, turning on all the plasma shots in the, the whole room or something. And it's something cool like that um, that they want to escape but seems cool to you. Um, what's a different kind of mentor figure rather than a bearded wizard? <laughs> what about like a downloaded like chip from the father? Yeah, the yeah, yeah. The, the, uh, an, a, a father's hologram like Superman got? <laughs> an AI man. Dentist. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> The, the Gandalf of dentists, right? <laughs> I don't know what that is. Um... That's All right. a book that knows everything. What's that? A book that knows everything. There you go. A know-it-all book. The internet. Okay. The internet. <laughs> I've been sent on a quest by the internet. <laughs> What's that? Okay, how can the little sister be the mentor figure? They could be excited about the journey that the protagonist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She could be possessed. They could be a super smart sister. Uh, or, you know, I could totally see a, a thing where the, the brother gets sucked into, or sister gets sucked into a fantasy world that the little sister came up with, but it became real. And so suddenly the little sister is the Gandalf of this world. 
um, because only the five-year-old sister understands the rules. Every time I play with my children, this is the way it is, right? <laughs> right? I'll be like playing along with my guy, and they're like, oh, your guy can't do that because he doesn't have the magical power of this. I'm like, ah, oh, I did not know these rules, wise mentor. Um, I got to tell you this story just because it's funny. Um, there was a time where I bought my son. He was like four at the time. I like all the little superhero figures, the little plastic ones because he loves superheroes. And so he's playing with the superheroes. I'm like, he's like, Daddy, come play with me. Um, and this is out like in the front yard with his superheroes. And he, he's got Batman. And I'm like, all right, I'll be Superman. You be Batman. We'll team up. And he looked at me, he's like, I'm going to be Superman too. <laughs> right? I'm like, all right, that makes sense. You can be Superman and Batman. I will be the Flash. And he's like, I need to be the Flash. Um, I'm like, all right, Green Lantern. No one likes Green Lantern. He's like, oh, but green's my favorite color. Um, and so I'm like, who do I get to be? And he looked at his four su superheroes, and he picked up a stick. And he said, you're Stick Man. <laughs> And I'm like, OK, what is Stick Man's power? He's like, he throws sticks at people. Um, so we had a nice superhero battle where we were fighting the bad guys. And I just had to throw myself at the bad guys. And it never worked. He's like, oh, that didn't work. Daddy. He's impervious to sticks. <laughs> the only thing I got going for me, son. Um, all right. Huge adversity for the hero's journey. What's some different huge adversities um, other than going through the pits of Mordor? Uh, not Mordor, of whatever that dwarven city is where there's a Balrog. Moria. Where the sci-fi pest control guy, his station gets overrun by pirates. Right, right, okay, overrun by pirates for him, okay. So you could kind of turn this one into less the, I'm going to go, it's a fulfillment that uh, my knowledge of pest control is what defeats the pirates because I can control all these pests. Um, you know, you could turn into that sort of story. Um, usually for the, um, for the hero's journey, what you're going to need to do is the adversity, you're going to have to cross a threshold if you really want to have this same type of story because it's the story of being separated from familiar and coming back to it. So really it would be he gets kidnapped by pirates, um, right, um, if you want to tell this. But you don't have to tell this story. You could say, okay, this is a rags to riches. That can take place in the same place. Um, I'm going to use his different archetype. He stays on it, and the, the stuff that he knows how to do turns him into the station manager because suddenly it becomes, a, at the end, it's a zoo of all these fantastical beasties that people want to come see. He's a millionaire because he's charging people because he knows how to use the, you know, the beasties, right? You, you could turn it into that story very easily. Uh, other interesting adversities. Yeah. Finds out the internet isn't always right. <laughs> internet isn't always right. <laughs> oh, it's always right. Uh, is wrong. All right. Uh, yeah, you guys get this idea. Let's not stay on this one too much. Um, let's jump over to a rags to riches. And don't just pick one of these points. Let's say, can you, can you come up with a different style of rags to riches story in a different genre that you could maybe be doing? Um, what different genres could you do this in as opposed to fairy tale? We've got fairy tale up here. Most of these are kind of fairy tale-ish. Well, well, what do you got? Thriller. What's that? A thriller. Okay, how do you do a rags to riches thriller? Anyone got any ideas? Yeah. Uh, born identity. Born identity. So I would. Nothing. Yeah. Uh, instincts. Born identity is definitely a good look at this. Um, a lot of the John Grisham books are this, aren't they? Um, maybe not the first one that got famous, can't remember what that is, but like a lot of the later ones are, you know, the struggling lawyer person gets involved in some sort of thriller and at the end has figured out the problem. Walking Dead. Walking Dead, okay, there you go. You could definitely say that. Tragedy, King Lear. King Lear, okay. Rig riches to rags. You flip it on its head, right? Um, and, or it's really just a tragedy in that he never gets this, right? Um, he never gets back to being in charge. Uh, he gives it all up and finds out they all hate him, um, except the one, yeah. Anyway, um, the idea is that you should be able to learn how to kind of transpose these things to your story. Um, this is not the only way to tell a story. In fact, you can ignore all of this on the board. But a lot of people are saying, you know, how do I take these tools I'm learning and apply them? Well, you could make a really cool underdog sports story where all you do is you say, all right, this is taking place in a fantasy world. All right? Takes place in a fantasy world. What is an interesting um, 
societal, societal aspect that our main character doesn't participate in, right? Meaning, what is wrong with our character that makes them an outcast? Go ahead, brainstorm something. In a fantasy world, what's something that different that could be wrong about our character? Um, whaling and they can't swim. They can't swim, they live in water world and they can't swim. Okay. Um, well, everyone else has good powers, they have bad powers. Yeah, or no powers. It's, uh, the, what was it? Tracy Hickman and Margaret Weiss wrote a story about that, where everyone has a magical talent except the, the main character. Everyone's a trained assassin except for me. <laughs> Whoa, yeah. <laughs> nice, yeah. Either that or a piggyback, they're a pacifist. Right, yeah, the society of warriors. Um, you know, yeah. Everybody rides dragons, but he's afraid of them. He's afraid of dragons. I don't, I'm, I don't have a dragon. Yeah, yeah. very Victorian society, but he hates a <laughs> Yeah, that's, that could be really tragic. Um, if you really want to make one of these work, what you're going to do is you're going to make them a loner, um, and their, their power and their lonernism are not necessarily attached. If you really look at a lot of the Underdark Sports stories, again, you could build whatever you wanted. Don't take this as you have to. But if you look at something like Pitch Perfect was the perfect example recently of this. She's a loner because she's weird, but she happens to sing real well, which helps her click with this other group. And they all happen to be good at clever dialogue somehow. Um, <laughs> And so, you know, you look for something. I'm alone. I've always been a loner in my life, and they're going to find something in this. Ender is a loner because he's a third child, right? In a world where third children are forbidden, he's a third child. He's, a, he's an outcast. He's also Mormon, which is kind of weird, too, but they don't make a big deal of that. Um, what's that? Yeah, he's half Catholic, half Mormon, which is extra weird. Um, <laughs> but he has a special talent, right? Um, and his special talent is, um, is destroying people. Um, well, caring that he's destroyed people, right? That's Ender's thing. Is he's a compassionate killer. Um, and so he joins a group of like-minded individuals. Um, the group is divided. They're not good, but um, he is able to make it work. One of the big things of the Underdog Sports story is usually there's some weird external pressure. They're like, oh, you're doing well? Here is you know, a, a curveball to make it much harder for you. Um, you know, another big thing is the, oh, we failed, we're out of the tournament. That almost happens every time. Oh, we failed, we got third place, and only set, the first two places go on. Oh, the second place is disqualified, and we move on. Like, that happens a ton. Um, it, but you kind of have to say, why does that happen a ton? What's the point? Well, it gives us a nice, really low moment that we can recover from, right? Um, you can see them working really hard, fail anyway, but then providence allows them to continue to prove themselves one last time. Um, you, you, you look at these things and, yeah, our, our loner has a different type of loner, as a, as a loner for a different reason. What is their skill? You can create a fantasy skill that is very different. Or if one of you are planning your story, like I want to tell a story about someone who has a really cool magical talent, maybe this framework will help you divine the, uh, the story that you want to tell. And that's the important thing to keep in mind. Don't let one of these stories make you say, oh, I can't tell the story I want to tell. Only use these stories or these frameworks if you look at this and say, hey, that's the story I was wanting to tell all along. This framework can help me understand the beats that other people have used in this type of story before so that I can try them out and see if they fit in my story to make it better. Okay? Um, let's move on, but first though, any questions on this before we go on to kind of more prose level stuff? Okay, so let's talk about the box. I'm actually going to draw it well this time because last week it was really embarrassing, but I can't draw three circles in a square. All right, so your story is pl plot, setting, character tied together by conflict. The box is how you see this. Um, I, I really like how George Orwell talked about this. I usually use a lot of his philosophy. His philosophy on writing was, was instrumental in me becoming the writer that I am. Um, and he talks about the prose as being a pane of glass through which you see the story, right? Uh, that's why I kind of like this box metaphor that you see. This box is going to color everything that the reader uses to see the story that's going on. And you have a ton of control by using this box over how your reader is going to experience the story. There are no right answers. And this is what really annoys me about some of the writing courses that I took. Um, actually, BYU was really good in this aspect. They didn't try this too much. But once in a while, you'd run across 
a professor, who would say, um, you can't use the box you want to use, and you can't use the setting you want to use, because those aren't valid settings or boxes. Your story needs to be this. Um, I think that's the worst thing that a teacher of writing can do. Uh, what a teacher of writing can, can do is say, I'm really good at this one style of box, and I will teach you my method. And you can learn to adapt that to your stories, and hopefully it'll make you better. Right? It's OK for professors to be specialized and say, look, I, I write literary fiction. This is what I'm good at and what I understand. And you can learn a lot from those professors. But you should always write what you want to write. And you should let what they're telling you inform the type of story that you're writing and see what you can learn from it. Um, I'm going to talk about a lot of things other than literary writing versus non-literary writing. Because that's so hard to define what is literary, what is not. Um, there's this sort of sense that we have literary writing and genre fiction in the writing world, and no one can put a finger on what that is, right? You, you look at somebody like Ursula Le Guin, and they're like, hmm, what is this? Well, it's literary genre fiction, but what does literary mean? Usually when people say literary, what they mean is that the box is really pretty, okay? Often that's what they mean, um, that... The way that they've designed that box is that if you, that the, the mere act of experiencing the box is so much fun that the readers of it are really excited by it. That's not always what they mean, though. They also might mean really, quote unquote, experimental with, um, with voice, viewpoint, and tense. But again, not always. And the truth is, there's, it's really hard to, you know, be truly experimental because everyone's tried everything else, else out. And so sometimes it just means we're using a very hard version of viewpoint and tense. We're doing, you know, uh, second person future tense, which is really hard to make work. I have read books where it works. Um, it's um, actually the, the fifth season by N.K. Jameson, which is a fantasy novel, is um, one of the, the sequences is, I believe, um, second person future tense, and it works perfectly because it's like a person who has lost their memory, you think, at the beginning, who's being told by themselves what they're going to do in the story. And so they're telling the story to themselves, um, and it's beautiful. Um, it's got really great prose, and it, it works really well. But it's literary because it's using one of these kind of really difficult things to write. Um, uh, quote, unquote, literary, right? Um, I want you to know what the tools are and what they do and then decide what the best ones are for your story. And we're going to start by talking about viewpoint and tense, because this is one of the most um, fundamental choices you will make regarding the box. Uh, and it changes your story in interesting ways. Uh, the first one we're going to talk about is the viewpoint, meaning uh, first person, second person, third person. And there, there are really. Um, This one basically doesn't exist. Um, and then there's actually two of these, which are kind of big. So it's kind of like um, right, the children of Israel, where like, you know, um, Ephraim and Manasseh are kind of like almost counted as their own tribes. But it's like this. Uh, it's really the three are first person and the third omniscient and third limited. They're not first, second, and third. <coughs> but let's talk about them. Um, for first person. What is first person? <clears throat> yes. I am the story. I am doing these things. There is a present narrator telling the story to you, right? Um, <clears throat> so second person would be you did this. You go this. The, the only genre that this has been common in is um, choose your own adventures, right? Um, though you will find literary fiction that does weird things with this sometimes uh, to experiment with second person. If you, you, you quickly want to look literary, you can go ahead and do second person. Most literary people will still laugh at you because it's that same sort of thing that like it's like film student type stuff, right? Where it's like everyone who thinks they're being edgy in film school is actually being edgy in the exact same way that everyone else is being edgy. Um, and most of the time, if you try this, you're just going to look like that. But once in a while, it really shines. Um, so, yeah. Doesn't it also get marked as passive voice, especially uh, if you switch 
switch views? So like if you're in first person and then switch. That's not passive. Passive is um, refers to whether it's subject, object, um, and verb. Passive voice is instead of, I hit the baseball across the wall, or you hit the baseball across the wall, or he hit the baseball across the wall. That's first, second, third. Passive is, the baseball was hit across the wall. It removes the subject. So it's passive, which means the object seems to be doing the action, whereas you want the reader's focus to be on the character. If the baseball is the main character, then the baseball was hit across the wall is actually the right way to write that. If it is a sapient baseball that is telling you a story, <laughs> right? Um, but in that case, you would want to just say, I was hit across the wall, right? Um, so the passive voice is bad because it confuses the reader, because usually they're like, wait a minute, who's doing what? And it distracts the reader. Uh, one of the big things you can do on a prose level, this is an aside from this, um, is you can understand that the reader's attention will follow the character's attention. Okay? Really useful for clarity reasons. What this means is um, that, let's see if I can construct one really quickly. Um, the door, the door slammed, I'm, I'm not going to write it up here, it'll take too long. So you, you, you write in the story, you're like, the door slammed open, T, the T rattled on the table, um, the people next to me screamed, um, I got really scared, uh, and then you go on for a while, and then you finally say, it was my father standing in the doorway who I thought was dead. The problem with that scene is the reader, the character is actually focused on the father, not on the T, not on this. Um, the character immediately noticed it was the father, and so the way you'll generally write that scene as a new writer will make the reader be like, yeah, but who's in the doorway? which once in a while, as an author, you would want to withhold that information for various reasons, but the new writer is not doing that. They're just like, I have to describe the scene properly. And so you're like, the reader's attention's on the, uh, the teapot, or the reader's attention's on this, or the person screaming next door, and while the character is focused on, holy cow, my dad's alive, right? Um, this is what you want to avoid. You want the character's attention uh, to direct where the reader's attention goes. It's hard for me to give examples. Um, I'll try and watch for them in some of the student submissions um, and, and pop them out if you guys, uh, if they'll let me show them to you. Um, <clears throat> it's just one of these things, there's so many things about the box that you will practice your whole life to do better, okay? Um, and you will be able to pick up any uh, well-received popular novel and find places where you're like, you know what? They probably could have made the box better right here. Any given book, you can do that. You'll find examples where they're telling instead of showing, where they're not directing the reader's attention properly, where they're using the passive voice. Um, these things are things that you will have to just practice your entire life to get better at. And it's part of what you try to do in revision, is to stamp out passive voice, to direct the reader's attention, to make sure that your, your sounds are right. You look like you've got a hand up, or is that just, nope, you're just li laying your hand down. Okay, that's fine. Um, but let's go back to these. <clears throat> Um, so first person, second person, uh, third person splits into two major forms, omniscient and limited. Omniscient uh, is an all-knowing narrator telling you a story, but without ever having a present fo uh, form. Um, limited is you are showing the world through the eyes of one character at a time. I would say that um, these days, this and various incarnations of first, because there's a lot of different permutations of it, are your two main tools. And if you don't know what else to write, you should pick one of those two and go with it. Omniscient, you still do see once in a while, and it can work really well. There's nothing wrong with, um, with omniscient if you do it right. Uh, the one I usually point out to people that is, in my opinion, in science fiction fantasy, the greatest omniscient book of all time is Dune. Um, and why Dune works is Dune will show you the thoughts of every character and scene at a given time. You'll just be jumping from paragraph to paragraph into different heads. What this does is, and part of the reason why omniscient is hard, is if you ever don't show someone's viewpoint in omniscient, it can sort of feel very fake. And why Herbert makes it work in Dune is he says, you know, like when the traitor walks on the screen in whatever chapter he comes in, like one of his first thoughts is, well, I sure am sad I'm going to have to betray all these people, right? 
That's how omniscient works. It's not that exactly, but you know. Um, he, you know very early on who the traitor is. The tension is, is the, the tension of knowing something terrible is going to happen versus wondering what's going to happen. Wondering what's going to happen is much easier to foster in a reader than how, uh, I'm so worried that this is going to take place. What effect is it going to have on my characters? Um, but those are the basic forms, and I want to dig into each of them a little bit more. Um, and we will start with first person. In YA, right now, first person is the default. You will find plenty of third person limited as well, the occasional omniscient, but <coughs> the default is first person. Um, why? Um, what are the advantages of first person? If you, as a reader, uh, any chef sort of stuff, what advantages do you see? It just puts you right in the middle Yeah, it's immediately immersive. It's immediately immersive with a focus on focus on character, right? You just nail that character. Go ahead. It's easier to have a very engaging voice. Yes. Voice is very natural. Voice. In fact, that's like the prime key for why first person works when it does. Go ahead. It's a lot easier to get your readers to sympathize with the characters. Yeah. Building sympathy is easy. Uh, any other ideas? It's a lot easier to have an untrustworthy narrator. Some books, books work because you know the, the um, person telling you the story is somewhat untrustworthy, and that's fun. Uh, Name of the Wind is a great example of this. It's one of the more recent popular first-person epic fantasies. Um, the voice, all of these things are key to why Name of the Wind works as well as it does. You've got a guy who's a poet telling the story. He has an excuse to wax poetic. The voice is really strong in the character. It builds a lot of sympathy for him, even though he's not a very good person. <laughs> right? That's like a, a key of why this works. If you actually read those books, if you, if you haven't read them, it's about this guy who's kind of an arrogant jerk. Um, he's sympathetic in some ways. He's very capable. Um, but he always sabotages his own... Every success he gets, he ends up sabotaging because he's too arrogant in some way. Um, it's a classic Greek tragedy in that regard. A lot of the Greek tragedies are like this as well. Look how competent this character is. Oh, their tragic flaw just undermined every victory they had. That would be a very easy book for you to hate the main character because, I mean, I'm sure you've seen films where you're like, I hate this person um, and things like this. But because it's in this first-person voice, he can present himself very sympathetically even while you know he's probably lying to you, and it makes the book work. So you can have this kind of classic tragedy with a classic flawed hero um, and have the reader still enjoy reading about them. Anything else that you guys like about a first person? Yeah. Um, it also addresses the audience. Yeah. Like the moment you focus on the character, that character kind of empathizes with the audience. Yeah, yeah, you can, you can address audience, which is a, which is a great advantage. Um, like there's this sense that uh, The Hobbit is written for Frodo. They really play this up in like the movie, right? Um, where by having a set audience that you understand while reading it, not all first person do this, but you can. It's a tool you can use with first person that is really hard to get across in the other ones, um, which then creates another layer, another level of interest. Um, now, I want to talk about the various types of first person. Uh, because there are a couple of different types you should be aware of. Uh, the basic one is I am telling you, telling, um, I, should, I should do this on a separate board. We'll come back to third lim limited. And, um, so we're going to go over here to our types of first person. Sorry to jump around on the board. Um, but there's this like, um, um, you know, character tells their story, right? Um, and then this is kind of what you think of your classic first person, where it's like they're writing their memoir, right? Um, but there's a few things you expect in this. One is it's way too detailed to actually be a memoir. But we let them get away with that. 
just an aspect of the genre. It's almost like you imagine they start telling the story and then you transition into an actual story um, with their flourishes on it. Um, Name of the Wind's a good example. If you actually listen to how long it takes a reader to read Name of the Wind, which you can get from Audible, it's like, you know, you listen to it across the course of four days. Well, it's supposed to be one day in World. Yeah, it's got way too much detail for someone to actually tell their story, but it's, a, it's an aspect of the genre that we just accept. Uh, the Assassin's Apprentice stories, the um, Fits and the Fool books by, um, by Robin Hobb, which are fantastic. If you guys are looking for a good first-person epic fantasy, she does a great job of it. Um, these, those are kind of the same. Um, it's like, yes, the character's tell, writing their memoir, but we get the expanded version as if they had perfect recollection of that memoir, okay? Um, there is what we call epistolary. I don't even know how to write epistolary. Epistolary. Epistolary is where you are collect, your story is a collection of um, written notes from characters in world. Dracula is one of the great examples of this. If you've read Dracula, it's all done through journal entries and things like that. But um, Illumine, which came out last year in the YA world, is a perfect example of this as well, which you're seeing a lot of new media versions of this. Epistolary is really hot right now. It's um, text messages and blog posts and forum posts. And Illumine is a lot of um, like government reports that are redacted which is what the fun of the book is. You like pick it up and it's got black lines all over the place. And you feel like you're reading something of all of these, this char these characters like journal entries and things like that that's been taken by a government agency, put together, and then presented. This is the found footage of books, right? Or really, found footage is the film version of what books have been doing for many years. Um, you, someone may have collected these, but you came along and you found this footage, these, these written stories, and there's rarely ever any actual like, prose that's not uh, related in some way as part of the in-world ephemera. Ephemera is a word we use for something like a piece of art or writing that's actually in, from in-world, okay? Um, so epistolary um, is letters. It's called epistolary because um, epistles... Like Sorcery and Cecilia is a good example of this, where it's like letters between two characters tells you the story. Um, but nowadays it's tweets. Um, and then we've got this kind of um, cinematic uh, first person, which is what you see a lot of YA doing today, which is there's no direct audience. It's not really like Name of the Wind. Um, you actually have a frame story where you see the character sit down and say, I'm going to tell you my story now. But any book that kind of starts off, I'm going to tell you my story now, or I remember when, and things like this, what these kind of cinematic um, YAs do this day, these days, it's as if the character's never writing this down. It's as if you're in their head, right, and everything is a, um, a kind of in-character thought bubble for the whole book. And they're describing their own actions, but it's never, it, it's, it's like the opposite of epistolary. It's never, you never really assume it was written down. Uh, you guys can probably think of some of these. I always forget what's in first person and what's not. Is Hunger Games first person? Yeah. yeah. Um, Uglies was first person too, right? Um, what's that, wasn't it? No? What's that? Divergent. Divergent, yeah. Divergent is another good example. Um, this has gotten really popular right now. Um, it's kind of like uh, there's a chip in their head, and that's recording the story for you as they, as they go through their story. Um, so you, are, am I missing any? You guys know of any like, first person that isn't one of these three things? Um, I suppose there's the, 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 the kind of hybrid uh, third person um, and, and then an omniscient where you have like Gandalf tells the story. It's not really Gandalf, but um, there is somebody who says, I'm going to tell you the story of this, right? Um, the Hobbit is actually this, but it's Bilbo telling his own story and referring to himself in the third person is what Tolkien said it was. Um, but you can kind of, it's, it's almost omniscient. So it's really what this is, is it's omniscient that has a first person um, narrator who's the omniscient narrator to you. Does that... Makes sense. Anyone confused by that? That one's kind of weird. Yeah. Uh, been forever since I read it. Uh, yes, I think. 
a lot of classic, uh, there's a lot of classic books that are this. And uh, yeah, I think Great Gatsby is. The, let me tell you the story of, um, you know, like a lot of the classic, um, even a lot of classic cinema kind of had this, well, let me tell you the story of this person. I have not read the book Thief. I know, I know. Um, but the old Robin Hood movie from the Disney uh, is this, right? There's an actual character who's telling a story. It's not the main character, but he's omniscient, and he's telling you the story of Robin Hood. Alan Adele. What's that? The rooster's name is Alan. Uh, yeah, 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 the rooster. Yeah, Alan Adele. Yeah. And a TV show that I think does that, Gilkin's Island, because it starts off with sit back and I'll tell you. Sit back and I'll tell you a tale. Yeah, that sort of thing. There you go. So you guys got this. You got that. So um, let's talk about these three. <clears throat> what, why you would want to pick one over the other. Uh, why would you want to pick uh, the characters telling you their story? What advantages and disadvantages does it have? So uh, a very interesting example I've seen that kind of undercuts. Mm -hmm. uh, often if a character is telling you their, their story, you, really, you, you kind of like, oh, they made it through. Yes, they've survived. Mm -hmm. uh, an interesting uh, subversion I've seen on this is uh, a very crass book named uh, John dies at the end. Yeah, John dies at the end by the guy who did Cracked, right? The website. Yeah. yeah. I haven't read it, um, but I, I have know people who liked it. Uh, I believe that the. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say it's a very inter like it's a very interesting way to do the characters sitting down. Right. Tell you, I'm going to tell you my story or the story of, and kind of shattering your expectations. Right. Isn't wasn't there a Peter Jackson film? that was based on a book that was the same way, where it's like the, a first-person narrative where you don't realize that the main character's a ghost. Lovely so, Bones. But the, yeah, Lovely Bones, right? Main character dies in that, right? right. Yeah. Um, so there are subversions to, what's that? Spoiler. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. You're still, yeah. I mean, yeah. The book is that's actually, that's, that's in the first chapter. That's in the first chapter, okay, good. So it's not that much of a spoiler. It's a first-person story from, first-person ghost story. But, um, so let's, um, let's say that generally characters tell their story, you are right. That it removes a little bit, removes tension. Um, that is one of the big drawbacks of this style of first person in that you generally know that they live. And the, actually they're a ghost, once in a while you can get away with that, but it's not surprising anymore because enough people have done it. Um, it still can be a cool arc, uh, thing to construct, but um, so it removes tension. That's part of the reason why I think the YA ones all went to the cinematic, because there's this sort of feeling that, no, they're not actually telling your story. You're living it with them. And most of these will be in first person present tense, so that you get, so it kind of removes this. But that is one disadvantage of this, but it's also kind of an advantage, right? Um, Name of the Wind works because the opening scene, well, the opening sequence, you find this person who is this awesome dude. Um, and everyone knew, knows was this awesome dude, and he's an innkeeper, and he like, hates his life. And you're like, oh, this is a tragedy, right? I'm going to read about how this guy's rise and fall. That's what this story is. It sets up the expectations for you, and what it does is it gives you that, that promise of tone, right? Where I think a lot of people would probably hate the ending of The King Killer, which I haven't read yet. Um, none of us have. But we all pretty much know it's going to be a big tragedy. If you don't set that up ahead of time and say, this is a tragedy, that it could be one of those endings everyone hates. But since now you're kind of waiting to see how he fails, <laughs> it's exciting. And so, um, but you, know, you also know that he lives. It doesn't matter that he lives because you're waiting to see how he fails. And so you can play with this idea in really interesting ways. Could you argue that this sets up a sense of scale and epicness in your world? Like depending on it really depends. Uh, generally, third person limited is your best bet for epic. Um, because it's best at showing a bunch of different viewpoints. And I would say this is a limitation of all first persons, except epistolary. Um, it, it, it's the one that tries to mitigate this, is the more viewpoints you have in a first person story, the more confusing it gets for the reader. Since you're attaching to I, the persona of I, remembering which I it is can get really complicated. Now, that you can do two or three, no problem. Really is not a trouble at all. There are lots of great uh, YA first person books that are two main protagonists each with an eye. But if you, have a, if you had a cast of 60, like some epic fantasies do, 
Wheel of Time, uh, there were 2,000 named characters, and how many viewpoint characters? There are like 50 main viewpoint characters. If each of those were I, um, there's something in your brain that's going to make it much harder to process which I am I in right now and who are they. Um, that reminding them every, you know, every third sentence what the character's name is helps you with that. So um, first person tends to be really good at immersing you in one or two characters with a strong voice and tends to be bad at immersing you in an entire world full of people. That's just kind of, that doesn't mean you can't do it. I'm just saying these are the natural drawbacks of the, uh, the things. Um, first person um, character telling their story does have the advantage and disadvantage that you need to create two versions of your main character. All right? This can be a, a liability or an advantage. If you're writing, writing a YA book and the I that's telling the story is in their 60s, and the reader spends part of their time attaching to a 60-year-old and part of their time attaching to the teen, um, you can send a mixed message or you can show the difference between them and the contrast. Those are both, like I said, that's not a right or wrong. You just have to be aware of this. One of the reasons why the why I think have moved to cinematic is they're like, no, I want to hit this teen character and have a sympathy for the teen character. And in this one, and in the one that's like the first person omniscient um, hybrid, you've got somebody in between you and the action. Good thing or bad thing, depending on how you write your story, OK? Uh, epistolary, the big advantage of it is um, it's much easier to tell a large cast of characters, because generally there are short scenes, um, and you list who they are at the beginning. And it's like journal entry from this person at such and such time. And then it's like three pages rather than a huge chapter. Um, so it mitigates some of that, that issue. But at the same time, epistolary tends to be much harder to attach with, to characters through. Um, epistolary is more like, look at this fun format. All of the fun, like the box. This is the one of all of these that the box is the most visible, right? Where you get to have fun with the form of telling this story. Dracula is a great example of this. Illuminae, yeah. The Martian? Yeah, the Martian's ha hybrid. Um, and you can hybridize any of these. Martian is, um, is first person epistolary whenever you're from um, Mark Watney. Thanks, I was going to say Marky Mark, but it's not actually Marky Mark. Um, <laughs> um, but whenever you're from Mark's viewpoint, I believe it's epistolary every time in the book. But whenever you're from someone else's viewpoint, it's third person limited from their viewpoint. So you get kind of this. Here is our strong character. No one else has a voice to rival his, but that's OK, because they're all um, like you know, addendums to his story in some ways to, to fill you in. So he, he did a great job with that book. I really like The Martian. Um, so epistolary, yeah. Um, generally, epistolary, it's going to be a little more detached, because it's not happening immediately. You know it's not. But you can do just really fun things with the form and have a blast with it. It's also a way to get around the, is my main character going to live or die? Because you could always just have the note at the end say, this was, you know, it's found footage, right? The whole gimmick of found footage is, we don't know if they, we just found this. We don't know what happened to them. Um, and so you can, you, can, you can mitigate that problem. Uh, the first person cinematic, we've talked about a lot. I've kind of outlined what its advantages are. Um, the big advantages being that it's the most immediate of them and the best at just getting into this one or two characters and using the first person voice as a method of doing that. OK? Questions on first person? OK, second person. Mm, don't do it. <laughs> Third person, no. Um, <laughs> second person. Um, I've seen it done well so infrequently, but the truth is nobody really wants to do it, and so it's OK. Uh, if you have a really compelling reason why you want to do second, then go for it, right? Uh, but it should add something to your story, and it shouldn't just be a gimmick. And that's really hard to do. Like I said, this story where you get the sense that it's somebody telling themselves their story because they've forgotten it was a really cool um, aspect of this story. And I'm not going to spoil that story for you, but that, you, know, you start reading it and you get this sense. Um, that's one way that I've seen it done well. Um, if you aren't like, I am about having a cool box, I'm about having four cool circles inside the box, then just skip this one, OK? And that's really all I'm going to say on it. Any, any questions on it? Yeah. 
Uh, you know, if you go write some, some choose your own adventure books, then yay, go for it. Uh, let's talk about third. Versus limited. So third person limited is the default form for almost all fiction that is not told in the first person. Uh, in epic fantasy, it is the default. In um, uh, almost all thrillers I've read, they're either one of these two. Everything is going to default to limited or first person. Um, and so if there's one thing that you can do to improve your fiction and get, get published, it is learn to either do the, the third person limited or the first person really well. And I often say that the, the grand skill of being a fantasy novelist is, or science fiction novelist is learning how to do a viewpoint in limited or in first, whichever one you pick, that expresses character, plot, and setting without ever telling you the character, the plot, or the setting. Right? You, you, you know that this character, you know that Mark Watney is a snarky pop culture fanatic genius. Um, who kind of has uh, uh, a mouth on him, right? You know that from line one, which I can't repeat at BYU, <laughs> okay? Um, you know, you know, like, you, it takes you one paragraph to know this person's entire character, their plot, and where they are. Um, and he never says, well, I'm on Mars, you know? Uh, he might say, I was part of the Mars mission that went wrong, but you see what I'm saying. The, the, the grand skill is to convey information to the reader in a way that is fun and not boring. And we will spend an entire session on how to do this, OK? So the second box se session, we'll be talking about how to not info dump. Um, but third person limited. Basically, what third person limited is, is you pick a character's viewpoint for a given scene. You do not show the thoughts of anyone else during that scene unless they you know, express them. And you don't see anything that the character whose head you're in does not notice. And you show it to them when they notice it. So if um, Earl came in to see at me, and I was writing on the board, and I, you're in my viewpoint, you say, he heard the door slam and footsteps. And he turned around. You don't say, Earl came in. This is because you want to cement us in the character's head. Um, as best that you can. And this allows you to kind of steal a little bit, not quite as much, but a little bit of the first person's focus on character for your third person limited. Yeah? If, you're, um, if your story has like mm, mystery yeah. themes where you're like trying to drop hints about other characters and their behavior, yeah. how do you do that? when the main character isn't specifically noticing them. OK. Did you guys all hear that? Um, so a couple of ways to convey information to the reader and not the character. One is the big advantage of third person limited is that you can show a viewpoint from someone else's um, head at any time and give the reader information that the character doesn't have. Very hard to do. In first person and in third person, you'd be like, anytime you're seeing a movie or a book cut to the, to the villains, they're now in you know, third person limited. Not really. It could be omniscient. But you, you see what I'm saying? So if you want to drop these clues, you have another character notice it. Or harder, but still possible, you establish that the character has a blind spot. And you have the, char the other character say something that the viewpoint character completely misses, but that the reader notices. This is hard and dangerous because they're going to start to feel that your main character is an idiot um, if they don't notice what the reader is noticing. But if you've managed to establish this as a limitation of the character really well, then they'll instead say, they're an idiot. I hope they get over this. Not, they're an idiot. I want to put the book down. OK? And those are two different things. You can have the reader be like, wow, this character is totally an idiot. Um, but the other way is to slip it in so subtly that even the reader doesn't notice and then have someone else point it out later. Um, the, kind of the sixth sense philosophy, right? Um, so yeah, uh, my, my answer to you is that's really hard to do without doing another viewpoint. So 
limited. Its advantages, you can have lots of viewpoints. It's still good with, with a character. Um, it is much harder to have um, a, an untrustworthy. You can still do it. Matt Coffin from The Wheel of Time is an untrustworthy third-person limited narrator. He will say things in his head that are in direct contrast to what's happening on the screen and in direct contrast to how you know he feels. Um, it's really hard to do. But that's part of what makes that character work. So if you want to see a character that does that, late Matt Cawthon is really good at that. Um, Matt Cawthon in like books 9 and 10 is, is really good at that. Yeah. What, so when you do have a revolving cast uh, yes. with the limited perspective, does this mean that you would have the same narration for every single character? No. Good question. Good question. So, so there's a couple answers to that. Can you switch narrators? So, in third limited, you want every viewpoint to feel distinct. The, every viewpoint should feel distinct. In fact, that's when you know you are doing third person limited right, is when a carrot reader would be able to know what character's head you're in from a few sample paragraphs from that viewpoint without mentioning their name. You want to borrow some of the first person voice stuff. Now, the advantage and kind of disadvantage at the same time is that viewpoint distinction does not have to be 100% accurate. Characters can be a little more, you know, the narrative can be a little more clever than the character is, or it can be a little more flowery than the character would be, and the reader's going to accept that. And so, if you read a Robert Jordan, Jordan book, all of the descriptions are a little bit flowery. He likes descriptions that are flowery. But if you're in the head of the character from the, um, from the place where there's no water, from the desert, and she's describing a bottle of water, she'd be like, I need to, you know, that bottle of water, how can they just leave it sitting out like that? Someone's going to steal it. Whereas the other character looks at the bottle of water and is like, only water? Where's my, where's my, you know, where's my wine? Where's my drink? And those two characters describe this same thing in opposite ways despite the fact that their descriptions might be more flowery than they would actually do them if they spoke them, okay? So it, the, the, it kind of does this sort of balancing act. That's my balancing act type um, rope between an omniscient and a first when it comes to descriptions. You can have a voice that has some similarities across viewpoints, but you want them to still be distinct. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. And that's the fun of writing third limited. Um, you should make your writing in third limited so that the lens through which you see um, the world is directly colored by this character's experience. Okay? Omniscient, on the other hand, usually has some sort of either present narrator, which is our hybrid we've already discussed, or what omniscient does, it says, our narrative. Our narrative all has the same voice. Narrative is all our descriptions. Everything's not inside someone's head. And we are going to punctuate it with the distinctive thoughts from all the characters. So it kind of has this smoothing effect where you have one consistent voice for everything except for the thought bubbles of the characters, which are all in their, their own head. And you get the sense, even when that there's not a present narrator, that there's a storyteller telling you the story. And the only things that break that viewpoint are the thought bubbles. So it's kind of like the comic book narrator? It's the comic book narrator. Um, and they can be as present or, uh, or not, if you want. They can be someone who's like, you know, I am the narrator. And you can do things like, he, little did he know. If you ever say, little did he know, that's omniscient. And you should try to cut that out of your limited, OK? But little did he know that across the world, this was happening. That is all omniscient. It's kind of more like inserting the narrator who's saying stuff to you. Or you can just leave the narrator out. Dune doesn't have one. Um, but a lot of the third person omniscients do have one. The, you know, the, the voice or the formless narrator who's telling you this story that knows everything and is going to lead you along the, the paths of this story. Yeah. So with third person limited, I yes. have a character who is kind of, he's in a secret identity. Yes. And his true identity is a big spoiler that I'm saving for later in the book. Yes. How can I do okay. from him? You um, have to cheat. 
okay? And whether your reader will help let you do this or not uh, depends on your writing skill. The way to do this in a, first pers in a third person limited is to say, um, I can't reveal my, I can't focus on my secret right now. It's too much pain for me to think about. You have to, what we call, hang a lantern on it. You have to say to the reader, I am keeping this information from you because, of this, because this character has a good reason for not thinking about it right now. And the longer you do that, the more the reader's going to get annoyed at you. Okay? And so do it very carefully um, or write it in first person from his viewpoints. Because, the first, because readers are fine with uh, the first person narrator. If the first person narrator withholds information, they're a jerk. If the third person narrator withholds, withholds information, you're a jerk. Does that make sense? <laughs> and you can be a jerk sometimes. I, um, Miss Bourne, I withheld Kelsier's um, big plan. Um, I had to be really careful with that one. But again, it is, it is one of those things that in a first person, everyone would have bought. And in a third person, once in a while, someone's like, ah, you cheated. And the writers will know that you're cheating when you're doing it. Sometimes cheating is the right thing, OK? <laughs> Very quickly, let me talk about tense. And then if you have questions, write them down on your slip. And I will address them at the beginning of next week, because we only have a few minutes left. Tense. Basically, you will have to choose between past tense and present tense. Don't use future tense unless you decide that you're going to do something goofy. Um, and it goes really well with like your second person weirdness, right? Um, Basically, you're going to settle on, she did this or she does this, and then stay consistent through the whole book. The truth is, looking at actually how readers read, the two are very, very similar. And by about two or three chapters in, the reader has forgotten which one it is. There is, present tense is a little more immediate, but also a little more annoying. Um, because it's immediate, but th there's a little thing in the reader's says, head that says, no, you're not doing that right now. I'm reading the book, so it has to have happened before. Um, but that is such a small thing that you can just pick your favorite one and do it, and, and it will not adversely affect how your book gets published. In most mainstream adult fiction, past tense is the, um, is the standard. In most mainstream YA, present tense is the standard. Um, you can do whatever you want, OK? So write down your questions. And I will get to them at the beginning of next time. Otherwise, thank you guys very much and have a good week. Camerapanda.com allows you to find cameras and lenses like no other site. Find the Nikon Coolpix cameras with the highest base ISO, or Canon cameras with full frame sensors. Find Sony E mount zoom lenses ordered by aperture in just three clicks. Camerapanda.com shows you prices from up to 30 different sellers. CameraPanda.com, striving to be the world's best camera and lens shopping site.